So uh, you already heard that biosim. The, well, the, so before I talk about biosimilars, I'm going to just mention biologics. Uh, the director general has already talked about it. It's um, th th they're used in several uh, therapeutic areas, no? And I've shown, and you, well, you can see them at the top there. Now uh, you heard insulin was the first uh, recombinant protein used in humans. And uh, thank goodness we discovered recombinant DNA technology, because if we consider that today there's around 350 million people with diabetes, how will we be able to provide them with insulin? Uh, it, Lily's original idea of extracting it from the pancreas would no longer be uh, applicable today. Uh, but now, with the recombinant DNA techniques, we do a small fermentation of bacteria and can meet today's um, world needs. So one thing that needs to be driven home is that notwithstanding uh, that products such as insulin have been on the market for more than 35 years now, it's still not accessible to a lot of people around the world. Um, uh, and even when they are accessible, I want to point out they do really uh, represent a significant burden on the healthcare systems. Um, so. Uh, that's not only for a product such as insulin and maybe in a, in a rural area somewhere in, somewhere, somewhere in the world. It's also in Europe. No? So this slide here, I'm showing you um, the use of biologics in rheumatoid arthritis. And you can see that basically uh, from this uh, publication, around 20% of the patients that have rheumatoid arthritis receive a biological product. And this is... Um, really not enough. If you think that, that 20% is principally patients with severe rheumatoid arthritis, what you really want to be doing is you want to be treating patients that have moderate uh, rheumatoid arthritis to avoid them arriving to uh, the severe stage with the joint deformation and, uh, and um, subsequent loss in quality of life. So, um, so the reason they're not used so much in Europe, though these monoclonals, these anti-TNFs uh, against rheumatoid arthritis, is that they're very expensive. The treatment travels around 50,000 euros. Uh, and I'm just going to mark the burden that these biologicals do have um, on the health caregiver by showing you this graph, which is um, from, let's say, the Italian Agency of, of Pharmaceuticals. And you can see that basically the... Um, the hospitals in, in Italy last year spent around, well, in 2015, spent 3.7 billion euros in recombinant, well, in biotechnology drugs, okay? This is around 35% of their total budget. So they're using a big chunk of their budget to cure or to treat a small number of patients. How is that divided? And, and this slide actually shows it even more. If you look on the... Um, on my right, you can see the volume uh, of these biotechnology drugs. So 3% is used in vaccine, 6% uh, in monoclonal antibodies, and around 90% in therapeutic proteins such as GCSF or, or erythropoietin. Look at the cost. That 6% is 45% of the total cost. So really, uh, th th these need, the cost of these uh, pharmaceuticals really do need to be driven down. Okay. Now, as Mauro mentioned, as the Director General mentioned, some of these are now off patent and can be used as a biosimilar. What is a biosimilar? I like the, de well, I like the definition of the European medicine agencies. So a biosimilar is a biological medicine that's highly similar to the reference medicine, notwithstanding natural variability inherent to biological medicines. No? It, it, every single word there is spoken because basically a biosimilar is not a thing. It's a regulatory term. So any, other, any protein we want to produce has to fall into that definition. How, why are biosimilars cheaper? If I can show you, and, and that's on the, um, my left, the panel on the left, if I can show, so the normal pathway for production of a, of a pharmaceutical is down here, okay? So I've got big, big clinical studies. With biosimilars, if I can show similarity to the originator product, I go, I go through what's called an abbreviated license pathway. So I do a lot of analytical work, a lot of physical chemistry, chemical characterization of the protein. I show it in as many ways as possibly I can with today's technology that it is identical to the originator. And 
discussing with the regulatory authorities, I will probably just have very small clinical trials, and that's a large reduction in cost in getting to the market. Obviously, being called a biosimilar, one question that always arises is, is how similar is similar? I like to show you this slide here, so it's for an erythropoietin. No? Uh, normally, I like to ask, do you think that these two are the same drug? The obvious answer, if you look, so basically on the left-hand side, you can see the distribution of the isoforms of erythropoietin. So erythropoietin has several different glycosylations, different sugar groups attached to it, so you have different isoforms of it. That's normal. That's what happens in our body. Uh, what, what you're seeing here is basically the blue and the, and the, and the yellow uh, curves showing that the distribution of the isoforms are different between these two products. No? But the thing is, these two products are the same product, okay? This is an analysis of uh, pre, when before and after a batch change, okay? So it's okay. It's normal. A company is producing a, a, bi, um, a biological protein. Uh, it takes off on the market. They need to increase the amount they're producing. They'll do uh, production changes, no? uh, maybe even uh, location changes of the factory. Maybe it's a different factory, but it's always the same product. And these variables that you can see here in the graphs that I've shown here uh, are acceptable. Okay? So there is a window. Are acceptable. There is a window of similarity, of, well, of uh, let's say biosimilarity already within the originator product. Okay? And it's this window that our uh, biosimilar must fall into. So it's really helping us to identify the variability we are allowed in the biosimilar uh, to be able to arrive to market and convince the regulatory authorities that ours is no different than the originator. Complicated. <laughs> How do we do that? We do that with a lot of uh, physical chemical uh, tests, a lot of controls, and we talk to the regulatory bodies in the various countries, okay? So here you can see uh, the regulatory approvals uh, in the world. The graph's a bit out of date. I think Russia has actually approved um, a guideline specific for biosimilars uh, last year. Uh, before that, it was treating them as uh, originator compounds, so there wasn't really much... Um, reduction in price and get into to the market for the biosimilar. So it's a big incentive they're now doing, uh, putting the guidelines in place. Uh, you can see that the Af Africa is lacking um, regulatory pathways, um, or maybe they're still pending. Maybe that's something we can discuss afterwards to see how we can help uh, put these in place. Uh, put these in place. So in this slide here, I'm just showing you basically that production of biosimilars does equate to a reduction in prices. So in the top panel, you can see for biosimilars, the average price reduction is around 35% in Europe. That's uh, an average in Europe. In the bottom panel, you can see uh, the erosion of price in India for, I think, five biosimilars. And you can see the price reduction is much greater. You're around 70%. The better, the lowering of the cost does result in a better economic perspective, and that does as well translate to a better health perspective. In this graph here, the green line represents the entry of the biosimilar for filgastrin for GCSF in Europe, which is around, I think was around in 2006. It took a while to get going for people to accept it, but that's normal. But you can see that over the last um, 10, 11 years, it's, it's overtaken the originator of GCSF, Neupogen, which is a line in blue. Not only has it overtaken, thanks to the price reduction, you, if you sum the green and the blue, you can see that basically there's nearly twice as many patients treated uh, with GSF now than previously. And that has also been shown to result in reduced emission um, uh, in the hospitals. So GCSF, if you don't know, is given after cancer treatment or during cancer treatment to raise your white blood cell count. If your blood, white blood cell count is low, you're prone to infections, and you finish back into the hospital, okay? So for around well, tw nearly 20 years now, ICGB has been f always been thinking that if we support local biopharmaceutical manufacturing member countries, the price of biosimilars would be driven down further, 
and, we, and Natasha will be speaking more about that, but we do that through a variety of methods, and that's principally trying to develop the know-how, the up and downstream know-how of several of these procedures and the quality control and then train scientists that come to ICGB uh, in these procedures and go back to their country to try and put it into production. And you'll be hearing maybe, uh, well, you'll be hearing as well from the previous experience uh, with the, some of the companies we've had. So over the years, we've developed a big portfolio, quite a significant portfolio of um, biosimilars. Um, I pro you probably can't see the numbers here. We try to take them up to what we consider could be pilot scale. For example, with GCSF, our procedure produces around 10,000 doses every batch. So a batch is around two weeks. You can see that from the bottom of the slide, I've taken this from the list of WHO essential medicines. So if you look at the interferons, uh, that the interferons request or calculated in, that are needed in Syria, for example, in 2016 are written there. All those vials basically amount to two grams of protein, and you can also see, uh, I put the asterisk, our procedure produces free. So there will be, what we do here at ICGB would be enough to cover the needs uh, in Syria. If you're protein, again, they, pro they approximately use around 250,000 doses. We actually teach quite a small uh, batch of erythropoietin, but it's linearly scalable. And also we teach people to do that in 10 roller bottles, but what, what we do can be directly translated to 1,000 roller bottles. I'm, I'm, just, I'm not going to go through the maths, but let's say 10 batches would be enough to cover that amount of doses. As I said, we've been doing it for several years. Um, we've signed several agreements. From, uh, from 22 different countries, so that's around 30% of ICGB member states. We've trained around 100 scientists in our laboratories in the pharmaceutical production and quality control, and Natasha will be showing you more about that uh, in detail afterwards. And what we found was it does work. This is data given to me by one of uh, the companies we collaborated with in Iran. So it's basically the price of their production against the originator, and they're also showing a 70% reduction in price in their market. And you'll note that their market has significantly much lower prices uh, than Europe. So uh, they're selling doses of uh, erythropoietin, the originator, $11 compared to around 130 that it is, if I'm not mistaken, in Italy. So, and I'm going to conclude now, because basically what I just hope I've shown you in these few minutes is some basic economics 101, or competition in biologics, <laughs> with the introduction of biosimilars, will lower prices, and it translates to increased accessibility and increased help. So what I'm trying to say to all of us today is if we can have a discussion period, any type of investment, be it financial, be it uh, regulatory, be it just in negotiation, any type of uh, investment in time even uh, by the governments of every single country will definitely uh, have returns, and these returns will be in scientific know-how, in technology, independence. No one likes to be dependent on their pharmaceuticals from other countries, so it will be independence uh, in, in medical terms. It would definitely be financial, I'll show you. I mean, you can really cut costs uh, uh, from the healthcare provider if biosimilars are pushed forward, um, um, are pushed forward. And, well, I kind of showed you already with the case with GCSF that it would translate to uh, better health. And with that, I think I've finished, and I hope I've managed to kind of set the stage for the following talks, unless there are any questions.